are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio, man. We are here once again. We have an amazing show lined for y'all today, man. We have an amazing author, motivational speaker, and also personal development leadership coach. She's the founder of Big Bold Brave. He is also the author of the book, Big Bold Brave. And and we're going to learn all about that amazing book. But first and foremost, I want to welcome Clint Hatton to the show. I know you're busy, man, but I'm, I'm appreciative of you being with us today, man. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, Shemaya. Thank you, man. I sure appreciate you having me on and definitely looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, man. So before we jump into the book, Be It Bold Brave, How to Live Courageously in a Risky World, kind of give the audience a little bit of a better picture of, of your background, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, you know, I, I love the question, you know, who are you? And I used to answer it differently years ago. I, like a lot of people, I just give people a list of all these different things that I did. <laughs> but that has changed for me. So, you know, who I am, I'm someone who really values uh, my marriage first above everything. Well, I have I have a relationship with God. I should say that first. But um, you know, as far as just as a person, my relationship with my wife. We've been married almost twenty years. Come April, and so that's been a huge piece for me. I, I really value being a great husband and and put a lot of effort into that. You know, same thing with my boys. I have three boys. One that passed away early, and we'll get into that here in a little bit but they're my pride and joy as well. So I'm also someone who, you know, considers myself not a perfect father by any stretch, but I'm, I'm a good dad. I'm very intentional and uh, take that, that role, that responsibility very seriously. And it's ultimately, you know, the two top things that I want to be known for is that I was, I was a great husband. I was a great dad uh, behind that, a great friend. And then everything else kind of falls after that, uh, in, in my opinion, and with that said, your book is, I mean, I think everyone should go check it out, Big Bo Brave. And today's uh, show title is going to be Eating Fear for Breakfast. And we're going to learn why, because yeah. fear is all around us. I mean, wherever you look, Absolutely. you know, you, you don't have to worry about it ever getting to your block because <laughs> if it's not there now, just wait a little bit while it'll probably <laughs> come pretty right. soon. So kind of uh, touch on fear because you do mention that in in your book as well. So how do we get to eat fear for breakfast? (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, writing the book was partly how I decided I needed to learn how to eat fear for breakfast, you know, and that's, that's really no joke because you said it so well, you know, fear is just lurking around every corner. You know, we, we face some form of fear probably every day, you know, and then it's, it's really just a question of how do we allow fear to dictate how we're going to live our life. And so for me, the reason why I decided to write it and the inspiration behind why I decided to write it is my oldest son, Gabriel, who at 16 years old, he had wanted to pursue being a a licensed pilot, which he had that dream since he was like eight years old. And at 16, he soloed for the very first time, which was before he even had a driver's license. So I want you, you know, should I picture that for a minute, you know? Think about the average kid and how much fear is involved just getting into a car and you're with your driver instructor, probably even worse if it's your parents, right? And and so there's a fear to that. And here's this kid who's getting in a plane and he did for a little bit, obviously, with a flight instructor first, but then at 16 years old, jumps in by himself and just goes for it. And so, you know, he he was someone who, in my opinion, just refused to allow fear to dictate whether or not he could fulfill his dreams, you know? And I like to use the the phrase eating fear for breakfast because breakfast just speaks to an everyday thing, right? Like, Like most of us, I mean, some people intermittent fast, I get it, but breakfast is something that's a daily thing. And that's what for you is that we're gonna have to learn how to eat fear every single day. And sometimes it's a small fear and sometimes it's a big one, you know? But he jumped in that plane and and he made it happen. And then by the time he was 17, he actually became a licensed pilot, which is the youngest you can be. 
And so he was just crushing fear and just going for it and, and, you know, making bold moves and, and what I call living courageously. And ultimately what would happen is just shy of his 18th birthday. He was about three months shy. Uh, this is September 23rd of 2019 and 2019 is going to be important with where we go with this as well, talking about fear, but on my third, he took a friend home to the university of Arkansas, which is a few hours North of where I am here in the Dallas area and dropped her off safely. And then on his return trip, he ran into an unexpected weather system. Uh, the NTSB who does all the investigations on that type of thing ruled that he suffered from the same thing that uh, Kobe Bryant's pilot. You know, of course, we all remember mm -hmm. when Kobe Bryant passed away with many others in that, that helicopter crash. Uh, Gabriel suffered from the same thing that Kobe's pilot did, which is called spatial disorientation. So basically, you just you think you're flying right side up, you're not, or you think you're flying up, you're flying down. And, and he flew into a mountainside mm -hmm. and he lost his life, you know. And, you know, obviously, hugely impacting, changed our lives forever in an instant. Um, you know, there's a hole there that will never be filled by another human being. But, you know, through the grieving and, and through just coping with the pain as a family, one of the commitments we made early the very first morning after his crash was that, you know, if we were going to really honor his life, then we need to start living the way he did. And he was really fearless. He really was, you know, he, uh, and not that, you know, we all have some natural fears, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was afraid of snakes and spiders and stuff. Just like he was afraid of as, as handy as he was, he was afraid of touching car batteries. It was something about electricity always freaked about, but you know, he just, he lived courageously. He didn't let fear get in the way of chasing his dreams. And I realized that I had, and then, you know, I said, 2019 is important. We all know what happened a few months later, COVID hit the world, Right. And so you know, our first couple of years before I wrote the book of grieving, you know, the, the entire world was now suffering from various forms of fear and loss and, you know, maybe losing hope that their dreams even mattered. And, you know, is the world just, you know, going to heck and, and am I ever going to be able to live out my dream? And I just got, and this is not a political statement at all, you know, I'm just saying I got tired of just all the constant fear being put out by all kinds of media, you know, both sides, if you want to throw in the politics thing, just fear, fear, fear everywhere. And so that's why I was inspired to write this book, um, to talk about how we've been able to move forward with our lives, despite a really difficult loss and how, you know, his life inspired me. And I also include the stories of four amazing human beings in it that are also great examples of people that what I call live big, bold, and brave and, and eat fear for breakfast and just have done amazing things. And so, you know, that was the, the reason for writing the book. That's my why. I just want to reach people. I want to be able to encourage people to just not give in to those fears. You listen on Refocus Radio talking to our guest for today, Clint Hatton. Go to his website, BigBoldBrave.us, and also get his book. It's on the site as well. It's Big Bold Brave, How to Live Courageously in a Risky World. And you touched on it. I mean, it's like storm after storm. You know, you had that situation with your son, but also, yeah. you know, yeah. COVID-19 pandemic, and everyone has to be isolated for a good while. And even today, speed up to today is, is still... I guess you can say fear being uh, pushed out in different yeah. outlets for people to either be consumed by it or be inspired by it. And that leads to my next question. Also in the book, you, you talk about to, despite all that that's going on with your life and circumstances, you still hold on to uh, hope and you remain yeah. grateful and somehow you find joy somewhere. So kind of touch on that with the audience. Yeah, well, for me, a lot of that, you know, has to do with just some foundational things that have been established in my life. I I became a man of faith when I was about 31 years old. So I was not like a church kid. I wasn't somebody in search of religion. But at, at uh, 31 years old is when I had an experience at a church that I just <laughs> accepted an invitation to go finally one day from friends who had been hounding me. And I went. And, and so that began my journey in a relationship with God, which, you know, I know there's listeners out there that don't feel that way and, and don't believe that way. And, and, you know, I, uh, 
you know, I recognize that and, and certainly don't try to push my beliefs on anybody, but having faith in God, having some, you know, faith in something greater than me, um, the belief that it's actually a relationship and that God is interested in my life. You know, those, those are very foundational things that have certainly helped me tremendously over the years, you know, cause like you said, I mean, this, this blow with Gabriel, you know, when you, when you lose a child, um, there's really not much to compare that with, and I'm not in any way diminishing any other kind of loss. Um, you know, any, any, especially losing a loved one of any kind, you know, my parents were in their eighties when they passed away, they both weren't very healthy down the stretch. So it was, you know, we were grateful if you could say it that way, that they weren't suffering anymore. Um, and that's a loss too, but there is definitely something unique about losing a child. You know, it kind of rocks your whole, whole world in sense, in the sense that, you know, we all kind of grow up knowing that no one's guaranteed tomorrow, but you just have these basic expectations that you're going to live a long life. And if you decide you want to get married and have children, that you're certainly going to outlive them. And then you're going to get to see them get married and, you know, just whatever your dreams are for your kids. So, um, you know, that was something that with, my faith, I think there's two things, Shemaya, that were huge in terms of coping with this situation that we're dealing with now, because it's only been a little over three and a half years ago. And that is, you know, first that I have faith in, in a higher power and that, and that he has a love for me, which I already said, but the second would be, you know, I was a pastor for 17 years up until just uh, actually the beginning of this year when I launched fully out into my speaking and personal development and and I have more books that I'm going to write as well. And, you know, just watching people, I was a mentor and a coach during all that time and worked with a lot of marriages, a lot of crisis marriages, a lot of people who had also suffered loss or ended up in divorce and those types of things. And, And so just seeing the way fear works and the way it creeps into our lives and the way it frames the way we think about our present and the way, well, for that matter, even the way we think about our past and the way we think about our future, it bleeds into everything. And if, if you're not careful, it will, it will crush you. And so I had those experiences as well, being able to help people and see how fear and loss would really affect someone in a very negative way and, and cause them, you know, to sometimes get a divorce from their spouse, sometimes just see their family implode. So, you know, faith and and trust that there's something greater than me, definitely a big key. Once again, this army folks are radio talking to our guest, Clint Hatton, and go to his website, bigboatbrave.us. Man, today we're eating fear for breakfast. And I think you probably uh, listen to this episode, like almost like taking a shower. You just, you just got to keep listening, man. And it's going to help you kind of see things differently. And the reason why I say that is because also in your book, you, you mentioned about uh, developing your character to love and, and serve others and live a yeah. fulfilling life. And everything you said so far kind of paints the picture of, of this theme for the show and and this show called Omni um, Focus. It's simple ideas that every day may not be able to see clarity, but that allows us to readjust the lens. So touch on that for the audience. Yeah, I, I love the way you said that. You know, I, I have a, a different phrase that I use a lot, but yours fits perfectly. And for me, it's just, you know, recalibration, you know, when we made that decision on the couch that morning, because that's, that's literally what happened. We were sitting on the couch when my two younger boys, who at that time were nine and 14 came out and I had to give them the news of Gabriel passing away. And and we made this commitment together. And, you know, that Shemaya, that didn't take away our pain. That didn't take away that we had future challenges and still do with just dealing with the, the pain of loss and then, and just life in and of itself, you know, I, I almost lost my, my, uh, boys are now 18 and 13. We almost lost our 18 year old, uh, just a year and a half, two years, actually about two years after Gabriel passed away, he was in a horrific car accident. The car was completely destroyed. Um, if I were to show you pictures, you would go, that person doesn't walk out of that alive. And he not only walked out of alive, he walked out of it, which is one little scratch, which even the paramedics and and police on the scene were blown away. And, and there's been other, you know, things too, along the way. So, 
you know, you, you do, you have to learn how to calibrate because fear is going to affect you. And you're going to have days when you, you know, walk in much greater courage than others, you know, and there may, (laughs) there may be times where you may have moments where you're feeling very courageous and you can eat fear for breakfast. And the next thing you know, two hours later, you're confronted with something completely different and it kind of sets you back a little bit, you know? So yeah, reframing, recalibrating, just, you know, reminding yourself of who you want to be, the the type of person that you want to be. Um, you know, none of us set out to be cowards, right? right. I mean, Shmai, those are fighting words, right? Oh yeah, those, yeah. Yeah, to a man, those are fighting words. Yep. And so none of us set out to be, you know, hey, I just, I think I'm going to be the most prolific coward that's ever been known on the face of this planet. You know, nobody does that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, you know, we find areas of our life. So, you know, even, even the idea of writing this book, for example, you know, obviously you heard my why I had a really big why. And so I was motivated, but that didn't change that I was, you know, fearful. I definitely had to fight the fear that what if, what if I'm not good enough? You know, so many people deal with that. That's their greatest fear. It's just, what if I'm not good enough? What if I can't write? What if I write this book and nobody wants to read it? What if, what if, what if, what if, you know? And so that was a very real thing. I'm not superhuman by any stretch. I'm just like anybody else, you know? Um, but again, when when you have a greater why, you know, when when you know why you want to accomplish something, and I believe when your focal point is the type of person you want to be, not necessarily what you want to do. Uh-huh. Because we can do a lot of different things, but that character you talked about and just becoming that person, when that becomes our focal point, then now something to help you defeat those enemies of fear. And so for me, and this is what I think is a really simple way, Shemai, I don't mean to make this sound um, like it's just so easy that from (laughs) after this conversation, having that no one should ever fear again, but when those why questions come, I just like to flip the script. So I began to talk to myself and tell myself a different story. It's like, what if I can write? Mm -hmm. What, what if I'm actually really good at it? What if I end up helping a hundred people, a thousand people, a million people? What if it turns into a new career for me? And I really love it. You know, I began to flip that because that's what happens. We think of all these, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, that are going to go against us. And that's how fear gets its claws in us. But the reality of it is, is we're fearing stuff that's never even happened yeah, and may never happen. We just have a good imagination. That, that's the problem. <laughs> Our imaginations yeah. are, are too great sometimes. And, and before we know it, we, we, we have a whole movie played out that hasn't even aired in any theaters, <laughs> you know? And, no doubt. Exactly. And that goes to my, my next question is because you, you talked about, I like how you talked about, uh, like your why, you know, and talking so differently than what the current circumstance may be as almost like a guiding system to get you to the place that you are striving to be. And you really can't do that without self-awareness. So touch uh, with the audience how important it is to be self-aware of what the situation really is, not the fairy tale or, you know, smoke, uh, smoke and mirrors in your, in your, in your mind, but the reality of the situation how do we become more self-aware of what's really happening in our lives so, so far we can actually move forward? Yeah. Well, I, the way I'm going to answer that right this second is, and, I, and I, <laughs> this, is, this isn't going to be super popular, but you know, I think this is the truth. It's just sometimes we need to be at our lowest low or we need to get really punched in the face to wake us up a little bit. Now, that's not always going to be necessary. But that's largely what happened to me, you know, and here it's not like by the time my son passed away, I was 54 years old. I've done some things. I've, you know, I've, I've uh, influenced quite a few people over the years and have helped a lot of people. So it's not like I hadn't done anything, but I had allowed fear to keep me from really truly chasing after some of my other dreams and stuff that I hadn't tried yet. And, and again, kind of getting out of that cowardly mode in those areas. And so, you know, I think one of the things that death can cause is it can cause you to really take a hard look at everything in your life. 
Um, you know, because I think we're all aware, Shema, every, I mean, I don't think everyone is aware that we're not going to live forever, right? Yeah. I mean, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, hey, I'm going to die someday. And now, gravity works. <laughs> yeah. And, and virtually no one thinks, and it's going to be really soon, right? Unless you're, you know, old, really old. So we always kind of just push it out there. But when you have a death like this so close to you, and again, it doesn't have to be a child, but certainly when it is a child, um, it caused us to look under every rock of our life. And so that included, you know, how do we spend our time on a daily basis? Who are the people that we give most of our time to? You know, are these people that we mutually grow and we mutually um, are excited about each other's dreams and visions and push each other? Or are there people in our lives that just kind of drain and take? And, you know, so we looked at all those things. But part of that for me was just looking at where my fears were. And so in that process of realizing that there truly is like no promise for tomorrow. I mean, you and I aren't guaranteed after we get off this call for that matter. And so I just, I just realized that I, I wanted to become the type of person that did their best to try and make sure that every day mattered. Now, not every day is an amazing day, right? Not every day do I go to bed thinking, wow, I changed the world today. You know, it's, it's not quite like that. But I try to do something productive every day that takes me closer to my dreams. And part of my dream is inspiring people and, and more than inspiring them, but getting them to realize that they have everything in them to become an inspiration. That's really, you know, what I'm all about. So, um, but if I could, do you mind if I jump just topics just a tiny bit? It's still related to what we're talking about. Oh, you get what what I want to jump in is is just the media. You know, one thing we have to recognize when we're talking about, you know, who the, the type of person that we want to become and overcoming fear and and chasing your dreams and stuff like that. The media learned long ago, and I'm not going to bore you with statistics, but there's there's been many studies done on this and the effects. Um, neuroscientists and different brain science data out there of the effects of fear over our lives. And what's crazy is it's become very clear, and media learned this a long time ago, that for whatever reason, we are more easily attracted to fear to the point where that's why they use fear to sell. They use fear to sell every single day. They use fearful um, taglines and headlines. And I mean, people get paid big bucks now to write headlines that create some form of fear. Like I need, I need to know this information or I need to be worried about something. So maybe I better check this out. And so, you know, media perpetuates fear all day long. And the scariest part of all, and I know I may not be on video right now, but I'm holding my iPhone in my hand. The biggest problem is, is we now carry the greatest um, <laughs> propaganda <laughs> creating mechanism in the world because it's in our hands all the time. Mm -hmm. So whether it's social media, whether it's, you know, watching the news, whatever it is, they feed on feeding us fear. And so that's something we have to pay attention to. You know, I'm not saying go live in a cave and I still carry my phone with me and I still occasionally watch the news, although very little but you need to watch how much you're ingesting that kind of stuff as well. If you're going to be the type of person that, that you really want to be and to fulfill your dreams and, and to be someone who is mostly fearless. It's interesting you say that because uh, one thing I learned, you know, when it comes to like chasing your dream, whatever, uh, is that the dream itself is, is easy. I mean, who doesn't want to see the finished product of your dreams? Everyone wants to see that. That's the yeah. most you know, fulfilling thing about dream because when you see something that is totally better than your current situation, who doesn't want yeah. to see that? But the hardest part in chasing dreams is the construction mode. We have to build yeah. every day. Like we're not seeing the end result right away, but we yeah. get a glimpse of what that final dream can, could look like or could be. So for the audience, uh, why is it important for us listening to also understand that 
you know, hate to say, but it's, it's a, a golden phrase, you know, Rome wasn't built in one day. So don't think that your dream is going to be finished by tomorrow. Like you listen to this show, your dream may be, you know, finished to look at until 10 years from now or maybe yeah. the next generation. But why is it important to not get too much uh, attachment of seeing the final result versus enjoying the process? Yeah, that that's that's such a profound question. It really is, and you're so right. You know, the for me, this I'll just instead of trying to answer it per se, I'm just gonna give your listeners how I've approached this because you're so right. You know, we can easily quit really quickly if it seems like we're failing and we're not getting there soon enough. And so to your point, the idea that this life is a journey versus a destination. I think is one really key mindset to begin with, you know, and it's funny because, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I was a pastor for 17 years. Um, you know, I've done a lot of preaching and I've certainly been around a lot of preachers and, you know, in the church in particular, we love to talk about destiny and, you know, I'm not, I'm not against the word and it's okay if you bring it in, but I think the problem with it is destiny speaks to this point in time where everything is now perfect. You now have everything that you want. You're now everything you're supposed to be, right? Like it's this thing out there that if I just keep reaching for it, eventually I'll get there. And when you study millionaires and billionaires and people that, you know, from the outside, we look at them and we see them as very successful, which typically in our culture, that just means they're making a lot of money somehow, right? But when we look at those people, often they are the most miserable on the planet. Mm. And the reason for that is, is because they were destination oriented. They thought the money, they thought the cars, they thought the houses and the vacation houses and the jets and, you know, the fame and all these things that once they reach that destination, now they're going to be happy. And the truth is they were never happy and they've always been miserable. And they're even more miserable in a lot of cases because now they've gotten to what they thought was a pinnacle and they, they don't even like their own life, you know? And I think a lot of that is because they're destination oriented, not journey oriented. And I think when you, when you understand that and when you begin to look at your life as just that, and I just, now I just focus on, Hey man, can I get better today? Or can I do something today? that is productive or has the potential to help me take one more step towards fulfilling the kind of life that I want. When you do that, I think it positions you much better to be healthier along the way and not have such highs and such lows. You know, you, you, you're probably going to be a little more steady. Um, but I think, you know, your, your point, your question is just so profound because most people don't live life that way. And so it's really easy to quit long before they actually strike gold, if I could say it that way. So to me, that's one really big, big, not simple, but um, I'll say it this way. It's a simple concept, but it takes work to execute it, to be just focused on the day-to-day -day journey. And I really believe, you know, as part of that is focusing on, we've talked about this a little bit, on who you want to become. You know, I have an exercise that I do with people now. And it at first is probably going to sound a little morbid, but it's okay. And that is, you know, when we when we see people pass away, right? And we go and hopefully if we go to a funeral or we're watching it online, it's it's truly a celebration of their life, right? And so people give what they call a eulogy, right? And it just tells the story about who that person was to them or to people. And man, why not, why not write it today? Why not write how you want to be remembered as a person, the impact that you want to have, the way you want people to feel for having had the interaction with you, you know, that they would feel better off for having known you rather than, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, maybe you've got the houses, maybe you've got the cars and the money. And the only thing people remember in your eulogy was, is yeah, he had a bunch of stuff but he was a complete jerk and he was a terrible family man and he was divorced a couple of times and he wasn't really a great dad either, you know, fill in the blank. So to me, those are a couple of key things that can really put you on a great track for a successful journey.
Once again, this is Andre Fox Radio talking to our guest, Clint Hatton. And man, today's topic, eating fear for breakfast. I, I think, you know, fear, uh, there's a quote I always share with people. And it's funny because I read this quote when I was a sophomore in high school. And mm. it was by uh, Blaise Pascal. And this is the same quote that I put in my wallet before I, I walked the stage at University of Toledo. So it, this quote has a lot of weight to inspiration in my life. Uh, Blaise Pascal once said, in faith, there's enough light for those who want to believe, but also enough shadows to blind those who don't. And that's a long extended version of Henry Ford's Believe You Can, Believe You Can, You're Right. But he just went in some detail. And the reason why I kept that quote with me and at some point in college, I put in my wallet for inspiration. It's because, you know, everyone has a story. And my short story, I won't bore you with it. But basically, you know, in college, I was, you know, slipping, you know, not focused, not, you know, wanting to pay attention and mess around. And, yeah. you know, almost lost the opportunity to stay in college. So I remember that quote from a sophomore in high school. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put this in my wallet and I'm going to read it as a reminder, as a checkpoint. So no matter how my day went, that was the last thing I read to keep me going. And I feel like that's the same thing in life. Like you eat fair for breakfast. Yeah, there can be some days you're going to be pushing that to the side. <laughs> you're going to be fasting yeah. for some, some time, whatever. But the point is you don't keep pushing fear away at some point in life you had to learn to embrace it and say you know what fear ain't going nowhere it's not asking me you know hey Shamai, you want me to come tomorrow or you want me to skip till next year it don't even make an announcement it just drops and i feel like when we understand that we have a better opportunity to eat fear for breakfast and get through the day because we know that it is there and because yeah. we know it's there, we no longer have to be afraid of it the way we used to be. Fear is natural, but staying fear is not natural. That is so good, man. I saw that quote on your on your site too. And it's just such a, a powerful statement. Man, everything you just said, you know, and, and if I could just jump on that for a second, you know, natural fear. I do believe that, and I'm, I'm actually right there with you, that there are clearly natural fears, right? Like I, I tell a story, actually ran into literally two bears in the woods late at night on a lake. You know, that's that's going to kick in that real fear fight or flight mechanism that we were created with, right? Mm -hmm. But where we get off track is when we allow unnatural fears to control our lives. And the unnatural fears are the ones where we're telling stories about ourselves that don't even exist. We're telling ourselves we're not enough. We're telling ourselves we don't have what it takes to get a degree. We don't we don't have what it takes to start a business. You know, I, I should be afraid. I'm totally afraid to go speak in public because you know what if what if people think I'm an idiot? What if people think that I can't speak well? You know, all those are what I call fears because they're projecting a negative outcome out of something that has never happened and may never happen. Right. And there's the distinguishing line, but I, I love what you just said, because to me, it's, it's a huge key to eating fear for breakfast. And that is, you know, you carried that quote with you. That's powerful, man. And I don't know how often you showed that to people that may have been something really private or, or maybe not, but I think what, what boldness you have recognize that this this quote really means something for me that's what big bold brave became for us you know that phrase big bold brave that turned into my book that was a phrase that we used early on from the uh, morning of after gabriel passed away that that's how we were going to live right that is so key and then i think a second thing that would be huge for your audience is recognizing that we need others too yeah. so i think it's beautiful that you did that but I'll bet you, you haven't succeeded without a whole bunch of other people being a part of your life and feeding your courage and your dreams and goals like me. Same thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny you say that because uh, the whole show, <laughs> the whole idea started at a local barbershop. And the founder, he's oh, awesome. the main reason why I, I'm even like interviewing, like, I guess you can say famous people. I'd say they're awesome people. Uh, I pinch myself sometimes when I interview some people, but 
that pinch kind of goes away because it's like, all right, at the end of the day, they're normal people. But yeah. the only difference is that they chose their path and they're living it. And that's, I believe, after all the people I interviewed. Like I remember the very first time I interviewed the first multimillionaire. He was a local business guy in San Antonio. And he happened to, uh, not trying to be political, but he happened to be the, you know, working in the White House with Mr. T. And uh, yeah. Yeah. a lot of people don't understand, but the process of success it is not, it doesn't look anything like your current situation. <laughs> because it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. And that's the point. Yeah. So if success doesn't look great, it's probably because you're still under construction or you haven't started the construction process. And the more you just get at it every day, it's better to do two push ups today versus zero for forty years. Yeah. You know? And that's the yeah. mindset that you have to have because that's what I've learned over the time after talking to all these brilliant minds like yourself, it's the same thread. These people, they get up and they go after it every day. It's like Michelangelo. I mean, I got so many quotes because I kind of study philosophy, <laughs> but like, you know, Michelangelo once said, uh, I carved the marble until I set the angel free. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people, awesome. people got to do that with their life. You know, what was your angel? You know, is it this job? Is it this career? Is is it going back to school? Is it, you know, being more healthy? What What is your angel? And if you yeah. if you stop chipping that marble, then it's going to look like, you know, a failure. But when I say failure, I'm just saying the failure of you acting and, and putting yourself in position to succeed. We put ourselves out of position because we are not doing our our part. And when we neglect that for a long time, time catches up. And then you all of a sudden don't have enough time to do the things you wish you could have done. Yeah. 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 You know, I actually heard a quote. I wish I could remember who it was, but it was, they were actually quoting something out of a study that was done. And the study was when they challenged people on what regrets they had in life, the number one far and away type of regret was stuff people never tried, yep. not regrets of something they did or a failure. Isn't that amazing? And that's why you got to be big, bold, and brave and go get that book. Go, go <laughs> to on, bigboldbrave.us and eat, breakfast, uh, eat fear for breakfast every day. Um, I think people should listen to this. I might have to have you on again, man, because uh, I My think pleasure, man. this is a this is a great conversation that can kind of get people off of the you know we just call them major outlets, if you will, because like you said earlier, every not everything, but a lot of things today is just pushed for you know us to be afraid of someone or something or yeah. whatever it is. I mean, you look at when I grew up in the 90s, I'm born in 89, but I was growing up in the 90s. My parents did a great job shooting, uh, shooting uh, me and my siblings from all the fear stuff on media and just, you know, whatever uh, circumstances or environments or whatever. And I feel like that's the way we have to be every day. When we go do what we do, be the best that you can be because that's part of eating fear for breakfast. It's saying, okay, instead of me being afraid of failing today, I haven't even started living right now, you know, uh, my moments right now. So my day is still fresh. So why not change the script like you said earlier in the show and say, all right, today, today, okay. First thing I'm going to do is say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Like, stop going to everybody, you know, hey, <laughs> hey, Billy, what do you think I should be doing in my life? Uh, hey, Susie, uh, what do you think? Like, sometimes we just got to go in seasons where we are just focused on our path and not so much on everything else. Because maybe we're not getting to where we're supposed to be in life. It's because we're so worried about what everyone else is accomplishing. And someone said last week on my show or a couple of weeks ago that, uh, you got to stop at looking at everyone's middle 
and you need to start in your beginning. Mm. <laughs> because That's good. we always get discouraged when, you know, it's our turn to start the process, but then we get mad or discouraged because we feel like we're terrible because no one's supporting us or no one knows me or no one blah, blah, blah. But you look at someone yeah. who's been doing it for 40 years, it's like, well, of course they're doing great. They, they <laughs> got 40, 40 year years. overnight success, right? <laughs> yeah. You started like 40 seconds ago. So of course you're going to have a little struggle. And I think the better we can embrace those struggles, the more we can eat the fear because God said that, uh, don't despise small beginnings. And if you can hold on to that, then fear is not as bad as it seems. That's exactly right, man. That's so good. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, I love you. You brought up your parents, you know, your parents were a catalyst for that. Right. And maybe not everybody listening, you know, it's going to be their parents, but that's why it's so critical. Like, well, even what we're doing right now, you know, we're just collaborating. We're just having this great conversation. We're giving some people some real stuff, you know, that they can really apply and, and live by, but it does take others. And, yeah. you know, I think there's an enemy of our soul that's always trying to make us feel isolated, like you said a minute ago, and always make us feel like, you know, we're the only ones and nobody pays attention, all that. And it, and it really is just a lie. And the truth is we're in a place now where we have really no excuse to feel alone. You know, people aren't necessarily going to be your best friend or know you on a personal level, but they can listen to your podcast and they can get incredible encouragement and, and, you know, value of stuff out of their life and they can find mentors, they can find coaches, they can, you know, find new friends. I mean, there's, there's a world out there that is waiting to help us on our journey, especially if we're the type of people that want to help other people on their journey, you know? So I would just say kudos to you for recognizing those things and, and applying it and living that way. And, and for any young person listening out there, you know, this 40 year, 40 seconds, man, that was so good. You know, you may end up being super successful by the time you're 20 years old, but there's still going to be a lot of life to live. So surround yourself to some degree with people that have lived a much longer life and have some other life experiences too, because you're just going to be better for it. Man, you know, the time where uh, everyone hates leaving the theater is when the credits start going. So, man, you know, they say time flies by when you having too much fun. I know we went over time, but this was too important to uh, I think it's timely for people to to get this little boost of inspiration because the show is all about story and, and people's experiences, because without those things, then then what are we really doing in life? Like, what are we really yeah. doing? We're, if we're just doing selfies on, you know the feed i mean come on like come on. It, it, it's right. a little bit more real stuff than that like don't limit yourself to that and i'll say that to say this don't limit yourself to the fear just because it's out there doesn't mean that you can't survive see we, we want to give fear too much credit and be like oh okay so because of fear i can't do this and we give it too much credit yeah like we don't even start and it's like Okay, because of fear, I, I can't graduate. Okay, because of fear, I can't talk to this person. Okay, because of this fear, I, I can't. It's just another way to have another excuse. So today, yeah. be bold, be big, be bold, and and be brave. Go to the uh, to the website bigboldbrave.us. Check out Clint Hatton's book and check out what he's doing. He's doing a lot of things, but I had to have him back on because man, he he's he's doing more than uh, writing books. Man, he has coaching and speaking and all that good stuff. So, so on this right now, what's the best call to action they can get uh, and, and support you outside of the book? Yeah, I think going to the website is probably the best, Shemaya. You know, there you're going to have some one-stop shopping. And if you want to pick up the book, you can. I do want to point out, because you probably have listeners outside the U.S. too, though. So if you are outside the U.S., just because of <laughs> shipping craziness, you'll want to go to Amazon or one of the online retailers. It's available everywhere just for the shipping purposes. But uh, the website's a great place to start. And I would encourage them. I started a weekly newsletter. So please sign up for that. It's just once a week. I hate clutter. It's not long. It's just a free coaching tip and a couple other quick things and just something that's going to your life every Friday. 
Once again, I refer to radio talking to Clint Hatton. Go to his website, bigboldbrave.us. I want to say thanks again, man. Take your time talking to us today, man. Oh, thank you, man. I had a blast. We definitely got to do this again. Yeah.